Hello, fellow Rotarians. You get a double dose of me today. Um, yeah, right? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm looking around, and I think we got a little spring fever, spring break going on. So I uh, haven't looked at the Zoom. Hopefully, we got a lot on Zoom, or if a lot are out vacationing, good. Have fun. Look forward to seeing you back next week. So to get started, we will uh, welcome guests in a few minutes. But if you are zooming in or you're watching this later on YouTube, shoot us an email at info at rotarygainesville.org. Let us know that you were able to watch. We can record that attendance and make note. And so to get started, the one, the only, the questionable joke man, Pete Inwall. Questionable. Okay. Well, all right. So today's word of wisdom is that intelligence is okay, a little closer. Intelligence is like underwear. It's good to have it, but it's not necessarily necessary that you show it off a lot. That's it. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Florida baseball team. Softball team is doing pretty well, but the baseball team is, you know, not as good as it usually is. And so we thought that maybe we'd inspire them this this uh, Tuesday by singing We Are the Boys of Old Florida. Would you sing? And what we're going to do is uh, be arm in arm, elbow to elbow. We're not going to hug each other because of the virus. But uh, if you'll stand, then we're going to sing We Are the Boys of Old Florida. We are the boys of Florida, F-L-O-R-I-D-A, where the girls are the fairest, the boys are the squarest of any old state down our way. Hey! We are strong. Join me in pledging allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, visiting Bob from Iowa, singing We Are the Old Boys. So uh, thank you, Pete. Uh, again, uh, humor is defined many different ways. Um, but I love you and appreciate you. Before we have invocation, it seems too often, often, too often lately, that I share sad news of fellow Rotarian and past president, Alvin Al Osabrook, passed away on March 19, 2021. Please keep his wife, Betty, and family in your thoughts and prayers. I'm now gonna ring the bell, followed by a moment of silence in Al's honor. Let us pray. We gather today to give you honor and to offer up our remembrance of our dear friend, Al. Strengthen Betty, John, Jennifer, Cannon, Lena, and his grandchildren as they grieve the loss of such a wonderful gift. I am convinced we can't be separated by death because our loved ones lives on in our memories. I ask that you help us as we navigate our daily lives to consider others and their needs. 
please help us to keep our thoughts on whatever is true, honorable, fair, pure, acceptable, or commendable. Thank you for yet another day. Remember the members of this club and those that are sick amongst us. Uplift their countenance and heal their body. Keep the club leaders as they continue to navigate the pandemic and the day-to-day -day operation of this club. We thank you for all things, amen. Thank you, Ian. Everyone may be seated unless you are a visitor or a visiting Rotarian. Uh, President-elect David Gracie has the mic out in the crowd today and he will allow you to introduce your guest or yourself. If you're visiting via Zoom, sorry, Bob, please type that in real quick and I'll acknowledge that. So now, Mr. Bob. Okay, you've heard quite enough of me. My lovely wife, Connie. Uh, sad news is we're going back to Iowa tomorrow, uh, get involved in the farming game and see how we come out, okay? Thanks for your hospitality and kindness all the way. It's been great to have you, thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Lubna from Rotary Club of Amman Amun. And I would like to thank you very much for uh, hosting me all this time, uh, attending your meetings, lovely meetings, lovely organization, lovely management and everything. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been great having you an extended stay for year two. It's been Re great. Returning thank you. Returning to Jordan, I think now. Correct. Right. So I'm uh, Tony Barr. I'm introducing Jacob Atem, he was lost and now he's found because he was literally one of the lost boys of the Sudan. And uh, maybe. Thank you, Tony. And uh, a few weeks ago, I was here, so I'm sort of new, but not real, but I'm just here as a guest for Tony. I'm really delighted with wonderful program that you're doing and I'm, I'm interested, so thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. Good to see you again. Any other guests? I'm looking at the chat right here live, and I see no names, but I'll come circle back to that. I actually had no requests for announcements this week, so please post those in there as well if uh, I did not receive it or missed it, and we'll catch it a little bit later. Um, we're moving along quickly. I will say this is a milestone for our club this week. One year ago tomorrow, 24th, we had our first virtual meeting on April 24, 20, and published our first YouTube video just two days later, and then things took off from there. You know, there's many to thank for this journey over this past year. Past President Chad King, past program chair and contributor Richard Allen. I know he, I think he's Zooming today. Um, Zoom master Joe Floyd who's guided, guided us through many meetings and technical aspects. Our resident techies and, and committed faithful West Eubank, Don Bugis, Tom Collette, helping out as well. Sergeant at Arms not here today. Um, I'm very grateful for all that's named in all behind the scenes, because I know I've missed some that have chipped in here and there. Um, Greg and, and, and others. This is where, you know, the classic, you, you get messed up. Brendan and uh, Mike just walking in, helping break down at the end of the meeting. It's a lot to produce, um, but everybody does it with a, with a smile. We have had a few moments of uh, frustration, right? Where <laughs> we're not quite smiling, maybe some sweat rolling in the forehead in, in the 11th hour panic. But end of the day, um, We've done an amazing job, and, and I've said it many times, but even just this past week, talking to one of the uh, district governor elects that's coming down the pipeline, was asking questions and talking about uh, and highlighting what we're doing and the example we are um, and what, what opportunities it's created. Jenny, program chair, uh, she continues to zoom in, but what an amazing job bringing people from all around the world. Uh, to speak to us. So it has been a dynamic year. This is our one year anniversary. It started and it's still going strong. And um, I appreciate all of you and all of you that have continued to make this happen. Thank you very much. 
So talking about great programs, I am now going to hand it over to program chair, Jenny Van Hart, to introduce via Zoom, our Zoom speaker for today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Taylor Clem joined the UF IFAS Extension at Alachua County office in July 2018. He is a graduate of the University of Florida and University of Kentucky. He has two degrees in landscape architecture and a doctorate in horticultural sciences. Dr. Clem has worked as a graduate student for the University of Florida's Center for Landscape Conservation and Ecology with experience in the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, Landscape Design and Behavioral Change. Since graduating from UF, Dr. Clem has lived in Farmington, New Mexico, working as a parks planner for the city's parks department. Taylor is originally from the Midwest, but grew up at just outside of Jacksonville, Florida. And spending much of his time exploring the outdoors, Taylor has been able to explore many of the nation's natural wonders, but calls Florida his home. Whenever Taylor is not working, he can be found hiking, canoeing, or exploring the world, probably not right now, with his wife and two sons. I'm excited that we have able to bring Taylor back to our club to speak to us today. And I'm handing it over. Over to you, Taylor. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks, everybody, for inviting me to speak with you all today. Let me go ahead and get the screen share up. Just to verify, do you all have the ability to now see that screen? Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you. This is the second time I've been able to speak with uh, the Rotary Club in Gainesville. And um, when Jenny originally reached out to me, one of the things that she asked or talked about was the need for talking about water conservation as being a theme or a topic of conversation with uh, the Rotary Club here in Gainesville. So I want to talk to you all about, you know, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program and some of the programs that we have here in Alachua County as well as statewide, but really talking about that need for making sure that we're thinking about water conservation. So today's program I entitled One Landscape at a Time, Conserving Florida's Water. And we're going to have time for questions at the end, um, but if there's any questions that pop up throughout the program, feel free. Um, I have the chat box open. Um, so there can be some questions that come in there, as well as if you, if anybody in the audience at the Cade Museum wants to be able to ask a question, feel free to raise your hands because we can monitor that as well. So let's go ahead and get started and talk a little bit about water conservation. So this map right here, uh, this is a map that I like to show in a lot of my programs related to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. And this comes from a joint project with um, Department, uh, Florida Department of uh, Environmental Protection, University of Florida Geo Plan Center. Um, and as we call it the Florida 2060 plan. It has been updated. It's now Florida 2070 plan, but this data specifically comes from that Florida 2060. And what we're looking at is as of 2005, the existing development patterns of the state of Florida. So the red is what we consider just developed land. That's like our urban areas, our um, residential areas, downtown areas, commercial, industrial, industrial spaces, etc. And the the green color, that's that conservation lands that are permanently protected. And then the rest is kind of like um, like a very low density ag lands, um, pine areas, um, some and or undisturbed areas that have not been developed or have do not have that permanent protection uh, designation associated with them. But anyways, so uh, this is looking at Florida's existing population as of 2005. And we know from uh, current projections that when this plan was put together that the population is expected to double by 2060. And same thing for that new or updated 2070 plan. So looking at those development patterns and how uh, we essentially how we build and develop the entire state and with an anticipated doubling of um, population, we're able to understand or have a rough estimate of how that development pattern is going to look. And this is kind of what we're looking at with predominantly, this is 2060, with predominantly uh, changes in land use happening in the central part of the state, um, not, not as much as the Panhandle or as north central, um, as you can tell. Um, 
And one of the reasons that we show this map is not necessarily to show that, yes, there's going to be a lot of land use change, but I anticipate as population changes, so does our demands on water resources. And one of those is how we're using Florida's water resources. It makes us think a little bit more about conservation because Florida's economic sustainability is built on healthy agriculture, healthy ecotourism, making sure that our fishery is nice, strong, and healthy, um, as well as just the ecotourism associated with paddling, canoeing, et cetera, uh, sportsmanship. So water conservation and its need to have healthy, strong water systems in Florida is necessary, but also if we're having increases in population, we need to think about how we're gonna manage water in the future. And one of those ways, as with that increased demand in water, you know, we think we have different strategies that we can use because with that water use doubling, we're also concerned about pollution increases as well. Um, and that all comes back to maybe how we're managing um, some of our landscapes. So looking at generalized data across the state for homes that have in-ground irrigation, approximately 60% of homeowner water use is attributed to Florida to lawn and landscape irrigation. And a lot of that is stems from actually just mismanagement or not appropriate management of the landscape, lawn and landscape, uh, typically overwatered and irrigated, uh, stem leads to a lot of other issues that we see in the landscape. But not only is that just water use, but that can increase uh, runoff of what we call non-point source pollutants, which could be in a lot of our residential areas is nitrogen and phosphorus. There's some other pollutants that are associated with uh, urban areas, but that can contribute to some of those algae blooms that we see across the state. But 60%, that's a lot of water for our residential use, uh, water use being for that landscape or lawn. So that's why the state, we do have the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. And that is a statewide initiative on how do we, it's an integrative approach essentially on how we maintain and plan high quality landscapes that are friendly to wildlife, they're environmentally responsible, and they're less work than a traditional landscape. Kind of. I always like to say kind of because it really depends on how intense you want to manage your garden. Um, and that's personal preference. So, but it ultimately comes back to how do we conserve water and protect water quality for Florida's uh, ecosystems and environments. So the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, it's not necessarily an aesthetic guide. It's actually more of a management guide. Now we do have aesthetic recommendations that we can give, but when it comes down to it, these nine principles is all really come down to protecting water through these different management practices. And these nine practices, and I'll go into each one a little bit, are right plant, right place, water efficiently, fertilize appropriately, mulch, attract wildlife, manage yard pests, recycle, reduce storm water runoff, and protect the waterfront. So um, we'll start off with the right plant, right place. That is like the big first step. It's the big umbrella term that we use in Florida Friendly Landscaping Program because if you follow right plant, right place, all the other principles start to fall in line and they start to work themselves out pretty easily. So let's talk about right plant, right place. Um, right plant, right place really comes down to matching the, your, the plants to the environmental conditions in which you are planting. So if you have a landscape that has full sun, you can pick plants that do great in full sun. Or if you have a landscape that has deeper shade or more shade, pick plants that prefer those shade conditions. Some of those environmental conditions that we really think about when selecting plants are climate conditions. So here in Alachua County, we're primarily classified as hardiness zone 9A. Um, and that's based off of our average cool uh, sea temperatures in the year. Um, and that can dictate essentially what kind of plants can thrive well in our landscapes. And I kind of think we're at like a weird spot, you know, geographically when it comes to climate, because 
you know, we're, there's a lot of amazing plants up north that just can't cut it down uh, here in Alachua County and in Gainesville. There's a lot of tropical plants that can't quite cut it in our cool seasons um, here as well. So we're kind of, you know, a unique zone with regards to plant choice, but there's wonderful, wonderful plants that we can choose. So climate, sun conditions, water conditions. Um, what are the water needs of each plant? You know, I wouldn't recommend putting um, a banana because bananas are commonly used for ornamental, not just for food. I wouldn't recommend putting a banana with uh, around turf grass because bananas require a lot of moisture more than that turf grass so you could potentially overwater or over irrigate some other plants. So what are those water needs? Put them together and only put plants um, into the landscape if there's high amounts of water or there's low amounts of water, make sure you're matching those based off of their needs. So just finding those ideal conditions, looking at your landscape, what are those environmental conditions and selecting the plants that do well there. By doing so, your plants are gonna require very little inputs. They can survive very easily off of the, those environmental conditions. They won't be as stressed. Um, and if plants are not stressed, what happens is they can end up fighting off pests and disease and other pathogens within your landscape and significantly reducing the amount of inputs, such as those different types of pesticides. I um, mean, if you manage all those uh, plant materials well, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a bit, um, it again reduces the amount of pests that come into the landscape. So right plant, right place. Choosing the plants based off of the environmental conditions that you're growing in, and you're going to be set up for success. So um, let's go ahead and we'll jump into the next principle. The next one is watering efficiently. So this comes back to that 60% of residential water use is attributed to irrigation systems. So there's a lot of ways that we can really think about reducing water use within the landscape. Um, currently in Alachua County, based off of our irrigation restrictions, um, you're only allowed to irrigate twice a week. Um, and that changed when the time changed. And that's just because we're in that active growing period um, for a lot of our planting season. As we start to uh, warm up, plants start to come out of the dormancy and start to grow again. So by county policy, you have or ordinance, you have the ability to irrigate now twice a week. But based off of our IFAS recommendations, we actually recommend just turning off your entire irrigation system altogether turn it off and only turn on the system if your plants are experiencing symptoms of drought. So we haven't had much rain recently, so you might have to turn on your systems. But what we find is when you kind of ride that edge of plants being drought stressed, it's encourage root growth. And if you have a strong root system, you're gonna have a much stronger plant because they're gonna grow deep roots looking for moisture. But if you irrigate too much, you're gonna end up having too much moisture in the landscape for that plant material or the plant material that's growing, um, but they're not gonna develop those roots. So it's gonna make them more susceptible to uh, other pathogens and insect damage within the landscape. Um, and there's a lot of signs that you can see that you're irrigating not enough or you're irrigating too much. The too much, um, dollar weed. If you have dollar weed popping up in your landscape, that's a very good indicator that you're applying way too much water because dollar weed will not grow if you're in your turf grass if you're watering your turf grass effect efficiently the way that tur your turf grass wants to be watered. Um, so anytime you have dollar weed pop up, uh, more than likely you're not irrigating uh, appropriately. And there's ways that you can update and calibrate irrigation systems to make sure that you're managing your system as appropriate as possible. Other ways is we're learning about how can we distribute water as efficiently as possible within our landscapes. You know, in our turf beds, we use a lot of those pop-up rotors and there are more efficient ways that we can use those. Um, but also in our ornamental beds, we have micro spray, micro irrigation methods where we're measuring water by gallons per hour versus the pop-up rotors that are measured in gallons per minute. So uh, within landscape beds, you're using significantly less water uh, than you would in turf grass areas. And that's just because the efficiency and the technologies that we have for irrigating those areas. The third principle is uh, fertilizing appropriately. Oh, actually, I forgot one point. Let me step back to this one. So the watering efficiently. So we actually compared water use to a Florida-friendly landscape that was following all of our best management practices to a traditional uh, Florida landscape, which is just 
following the twice a week method that uh, we have in Alaska County. And we found that the Florida friendly landscapes were using about 20% of the traditional Florida landscapes when it comes to water usage. So a significant reduction where actually the cost savings you would, uh, the cost savings in, in water use would, uh, you'd pay off that retrofitting equipment um, in about a year or two based off of your water use savings. So it's a pretty quick turnaround in your savings as well. So the third principle is fertilizing appropriately. So some of the big issues that we have is certain plants have certain nutrient means, uh, sorry, certain plants have certain nutrient needs. And, you know, it's very common that we just go out and we just throw out a 10, 10, 10 fertilizer, uh, but it's not appropriate. Um, always do a soil test before you do any type of um, soil test before you do any type of fertilization because you don't want to apply anything unless the, the plant material needs it um, because one issue is if your ph is imbalanced in your soil uh, the soil test can tell you because if your ph is imbalanced your plants won't be able to uptake nutrients as efficiently so you end up losing a lot of those nutrients um, additionally you don't want to apply nutrients that are already in the soil so one of the most common ones is phosphorus Phosphorus is actually in Alachua County and a lot of counties around the state, you cannot apply phosphorus, which is the second number on a fertilizer bag. You cannot apply it unless uh, you have a soil test determining that you're deficient because phosphorus is one of our major contributors to non-point source pollution. So unless you need it in your landscape, there should be no reason to apply it. And phosphorus is already naturally high in our soils anyway. So there's very, very rare occurrence that you would ever have to apply phosphorus to your landscape. Uh, additionally, you're gonna be following our best management practices for nitrogen applications based off of what you're growing. Because what you're growing, we're gonna recommend different amounts of nitrogen based off of the science that we have for those. So doing following that soil test is gonna be a, uh, following that soil test is going to be a great way for helping determine that best management practice or that strategy for uh, nutrient management for your landscape. So you can always do a soil test and then I get a copy of it here in Alachua County. I um, mean, you'll get a copy as well. And we can talk about that management and how to um, make sure you are fertilizing appropriately for your landscape. So a lot of our trees and ornamental plants, they actually require very little fertilizer, little to none. Uh, typically we're applying nutrients uh, via fertilizer um, only if our plants are really showing a deficiency. So the fourth principle is mulch. So mulching can help protect the soil. It can actually help improve the organic uh, matter content of a soil and when you have increased organic matter um, it can help hold on to nutrients in the soil much better versus our sandy soil nutrients just they just get sucked right through and end up in our uh, our waters pretty quickly unless they're bound to organic matter so uh, mulch can help build that up uh, as it breaks down also it helps just aesthetically it helps tie the entire landscape together uh, aesthetically it can add a nice little impact um, but it also helps regulate weed growth. So uh, about a three inch depth of mulch is gonna help actually reduce weed pressure in your landscape. You don't wanna go too deep though, because what ends up happening is it actually holds too much moisture and uh, that can lead to fungal issues. So you need that like Goldilocks number. You need about three inch mulch depth and you just use your middle finger. That's usually what I recommend is just use your middle finger as a depth gauge. Um, to determine your uh, mulch depth and uh, you can help reduce use your water more efficiently as well as keep that weed pressure down and help build organic matter but it's important to think about what are the sources uh, that we're getting our mulch from don't use cypress or cedar none of that is sustainable we don't recommend using that at all um, don't use dyed mulches um, don't use um, any rubber mulch I can't imagine if you're using rubber mulch, but don't use that. Stones and gravel, kind of like that Southwest Zurich landscape. We don't recommend that either. Um, our recommendations are like natural leaf litter, um, 
and pine byproducts. So it could be pine straw, pine bark, which is very common. Um, you can also get Malaleuca, which is the invasive species in South Florida, but it's chipped up and sterilized and all that stuff. And it's a way that we can help control invasive species and also give a use to it. Um, so mal Maluca as well as eucalyptus, very similar. Um, so a lot of the, the products that we're using as mulch just is really making sure that it's sustainably sourced. Um, pine is, the, is typically the best. I prefer pine straw uh, just because with our Florida storms, pine bark and a lot, of, a lot of other mulches will just float away. Pine straw, even though it's light and airy, all the little needles start to interlock with one another and they create a solid mat so they don't float, float away. Um, as easily. The fifth principle is attracting wildlife. So going back to the uh, original image that I showed of the development that you're seeing across the state. Um, oh, sorry, I had a question come in. Is there a specific color of mulch that is better than others? There is dark mulch or lighter mulch. No, mulch color, as long as it's not dyed, um, as long as it's not a dyed mulch, it's fine. It's just, at that point, it comes down to aesthetic. So there are dark mulches that, is gonna, that you can. I, would, no, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend any gator colors uh, just because the, that's all artificially dyed. Um, although that would be interesting to see nonetheless. If anybody knows, <laughs> please let me know. I'd like to get a picture of it. So, um, so it really comes down to aesthetics. Really, you know, when you start to see some dyed mulches, I just don't recommend it. Um, as well as you'll see dyed like rubber mulches um, and the rubber is just bad because that will actually heat up the soil and um, it'll, it'll degrade some of the soil because it just gets way too hot. But anyways, um, attracting wildlife, principle number five. So that is just as the state is growing, we're looking at ways, how can we reconnect a lot of the wildlife? You know, birds and other important pollinators. One of my favorite host plants is the one that we see up on the top right. Um, that is a passion flower vine. It's a wonderful, beautiful uh, flower. It's very unique to Florida and the um, zebra longwing. It's, that's the butterfly that serves it, that it's host. Um, there's a couple of other others, but it's important to think about how can our landscapes attract wildlife through nectar sources, food sources, water availability, and shelter, because it helps reconnect that disrupted um, environment that is caused by development. So it allows uh, biodiversity or that wildlife to come to your landscape that can live there, or some will use it as kind of like a a stopping point along their travels as they migrate or move around their range. So attracting wildlife is very important and it's just through proper plant selection or targeted plant selection and we have the resources in our office to help uh, help you determine what would be the best wildlife or best plans or strategies to attract specific wildlife. Next is managing yard uh, landscape pests responsibly. So how we typically manage yard pest is not the correct way. Um, so we, we recommend following the integrated pest management. All landscapes have pests, all landscapes have insects, but think in your head, think of a number, um, how of the total like species of insects that are in Florida, how many of them percent wise percent would you anticipate to be designated as a pest? So they'd be problematic within our landscapes or gardens. Think of that number. Okay. What would, I, I kind of have a, a view kind of open. What are some of y'all's guesses that you have? You can do show of hands. How many of you thought greater than 10? Greater than 10%. Okay. I'm trying to see. Okay. How many, okay, how many of you, I'm just going to go straight to the answer. How many of you guessed about, yeah, that's, that's close. I guess I'm going to put in 2%. It's roughly 1%. So 1% of insects are actually considered pests. The rest are beneficial or benign. They don't really cause any damage. They don't do anything. Um, oh, you're including, <laughs> there you go. Um, so, uh, the managing landscape pest responsible is 
yes, we need to make sure that we set realistic expectations. There's going to be insects in our landscape. A lot of them are going to be benign or they're going to be actually beneficial. But some of those pests that come in, they're going to be there. If you have St. Augustine grass, yeah, you're going to have chinch bugs. But if you manage your turf grass appropriately, the chinch bug population won't be problematic. And actually, they'll end up going away. So to help reduce landscape pest in the first place is manage your landscape following right plant right place and those other principles that we talked about so if you have a strong healthy plant those pests are going to leave it alone they don't care um, they don't want it you know it's when you have those plants that aren't being managed appropriately they're getting overwatered or underwatered um, and or they're being fertilized too much you might as well just put like a big neon light over it. it's like all you can eat buffet that all the bugs are going to come to so if you have a pest problem in your landscape typically it's going to be a cultural problem that if you start thinking about how can i make sure i'm managing my landscape appropriately you know are my sun conditions appropriately are my shade conditions appropriate that can improve that plant health more than likely those pests are going to go away next would be uh the mechanical removal so you know, some garden landscape plants, you may get aphids on them. You can go in and you can manually just remove the aphids from those plants. Next is we have biological control. So like that big red beetle, that's not the ladybug uh, that you see on here. That's the air potato beetle. That's been a invasive species powerhouse all throughout the state. So we have air potato vine, highly, highly, highly invasive. And um, it's all over Gainesville, but now you'll see it all over Gainesville. It looks like Swiss cheese, um, has a bunch of holes in it. And that's thanks to this little guy. Rather than trying to go around and spray chemicals to kill uh, the air potato vine, we just release these little beetles. What they do is they go out, they munch the vines, kill it back, and then a lot of them die off. The population, a little of the population persists through the winter. And then once the air potato vine starts coming back again, they munch on it and kill it back. Um, so it's a biological weapon that we use to manage our, our some of these pests. And one uh, question that popped up earlier is, well, what about mosquito control? So mosquito control really depends, but there's a great uh, where the mosquitoes are. Um, if you have standing water in like bird bath, bromeliads, or anything like that, I recommend flushing out that water um, on a weekly basis. But if you have great biological control that can be beneficial to in that management of uh, mosquitoes is called BT. Um, it's just a bacteria strain. And then if all else fails, then you can get to that chemical application that you can spray on your landscape. And uh, because some of the issues that we come in is if you respray the same type of insecticide or pesticide, those insects develop a um, resistance to that insecticide and it's no longer working um, and it won't have the same benefits that it usually does. So you can spray the insects with that insecticide and it won't do a, a thing to them. So that's a really big concern that we have with that repeated application of uh, chemical or repeated application of insecticides without following best management practices. So managing our pest landscape pest responsibility responsibly will help protect the water quality, but it'll also help make sure that you're managing your landscape appropriately. Next is recycling yard waste. You know, there's a lot of things that we can put into those bags up on the street corner, but if we have the ability to bring them into our landscape and use them as a leaf litter, that breaks down and just puts nutrients right back um, into the soil that the plants can just uptake again. So every time we're taking grass clippings, leaf litter, et cetera, and we're putting it on the curb for someone to pick up, we're losing that. That's leaving that system and it's going to uh, the waste management facility. Whereas if you can keep that in your landscape and allow it to break down and the plants can just reuse those nutrients again, it's wonderful. Um, a common issue that we do see is yard waste or just leaf litter in the storm drains. That's a huge source of nutrient um, loading to our water bodies because like leaf litter, grass clippings, etc. That first flush or that first big rains that we get within the, the season as we warm up, that loads our water bodies with a lot of nutrients because as all that breaks down, it releases nitrogen and phosphorus into the water bodies. So how can you reuse that yard waste? A lot of people do composting. 
uh, which is a wonderful, but it's not always necessary, but there's always creative ways like just using that leaf litter. Um, I mulch everything with my lawnmower um, and just sharpen my blade more regularly. Um, reduce stormwater runoff. So how are you using that water in your landscape? You know, a lot of times it's just the water comes off your roof and right out in the storm drain. Um, there's other great and easy ways that we have the ability to reuse that water. Um, rain barrels are very easy. Um, other ways where you can build like rain, rain gardens or you can have cisterns that they can help collect that water, allow it infiltrate into the soil on the property rather than putting it in the storm drain system where it can end up leading to other issues down, downstream. And the ninth principle is protect the waterfront. Obviously, this, the whole program relates to water. Specifically with FFL program, we talk about a 10 foot buffer, a no maintenance buffer right along water bodies um, because those plants help absorb excess of nutrients and stop a lot of that from entering water that's uh, entering water bodies that might be flowing through this along the surface. So those plants can help intercept a lot of that, um, the, the, the pollutants before it causes any issues. We call it a 10 foot no buff, uh, no maintenance zone. But other ways, you know, I talk about protecting the waterfront in Florida, we're all, I mean, everywhere you live, you're directly connected to a water body. It's just you're indirectly or directly you know, some homes that live directly on it, yes, you're directly related to it, but indirectly, all of our water flows to a stream or creek or some type of water body. So our behaviors relate to it. So, you know, really thinking about, you know, if you're living on water bodies, having that no maintenance area to help directly uh, minimize impacts. Um, and then what you can do is just thinking about how your behaviors impact downstreams as well. One question that came in that kind of relates to this reduced stormwater is what about solutions to use gray water generated bar residential homes? So yes, there are some standards. I don't know if it's in Florida, uh, the International Home Building Code about gray water use, but there's a lot of strategies about using gray water within homes to help reduce. Um, you know, the idea is, but making that standard in homes is kind of tough uh, because of cost. I was gonna be really expensive to implement. Retrofitting are some little things that you can do um, to help with gray water, um, but it can be hard to do. But I think it's gonna be something that we're gonna see more common on the horizon. Um, because there's a lot of stuff that gray water that's going to be in your home that you're not going to want to put in your landscape, but there is some gray water that you can then filter throughout your home to put to use in like say your your toilets. Um, so then that brown water ends up going to the wastewater management facility. So, um, you know, cisterns, they're like a giant rain barrel. Um, those are becoming very common because you can connect a cistern up to your roof. Um, and it can collect all the water from your roof. And then that's gonna be more than, efficient, more than sufficient to make sure to irrigate your entire landscape throughout the year with the amount of water that we can get here in Central Florida. So um, those are the nine principles of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. I know it's like a, wham, we just crashed through a lot of them, but um, it's really important that it starts with right plant, right place. And, um, by following right plant, right place, you have the ability to just make sure that you're conserving water and protecting Florida's water resources. And it becomes a major stepping stone. And like I mentioned, stepping stone into proper management, uh, but it also becomes a way that you can really kind of lead your community in trying to make these educated decisions. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, it's not an aesthetic guide, it's more of a management guide. So. Any HOA that has landscape codes and covenances, they can adopt it. Municipalities have the ability to adopt it, or just as individual, you have the ability to adopt it and still maintain these aesthetic qualities that you want. You're just letting these management principles kind of determine how you're going to choose plant material, um, but that aesthetics end up coming up to you. So here's some resources that we do have. Um, we have a Florida Friendly Landscaping webpage, and I can send these all out to Jenny so she can make sure that everybody gets copies of them. I don't want to go through all these with you, but we have a podcast, we have a blog page. Um, uh, we have our just regular county extension page. We have a YouTube channel where you can look up UF IFAS extension in Alachua County, and just a bunch of recorded webinars, as well as we have a Facebook page if you're on there, Alachua County Master Gardeners. 
Um, so we are moving our office. We used to be up at the um, we used to be up at the airport, the fair, county fairgrounds, but that's all moving. We're in a temporary office out in Jonesville right now, but the new permanent office, which is under construction, is out in Newberry. Um, if you're familiar with where that Canterbury Equine facility is, um, right on Newberry Road on the east side of Newberry, that's where our new office is. They're putting roofs up right now. So, um, but in our office, we have two horticulture related agents. I'm the environmental and community horticulture agent, as well as we also have Dr. Tatiana Sanchez. She's on that commercial side. So she works a lot with those green industry professionals um, and licensing needed to practice. Um, so now I can open up to questions because I want to make sure I give you all plenty of time to get questions because um, I know there's some that popped up. I know that I answered some throughout the program, but um, I want to make sure that you all have that opportunity to ask me those. Um, one that I do have that already popped up on the chat box is, can you explain what integrated pest management entails? How is it different from other methods? So the IPM strategy, it starts with cultural management. If there's a problem with your landscape with pests, how are you managing it culturally? Can you make changes culturally to that landscape? So that is, are plants getting enough water? Is there enough sunlight? Is there soil conditions? Are you following appropriate nutrient management guidelines? Um, so if you, I would probably say 85 to 95% of the time, if you're doing appropriate, if you start making appropriate cultural management decisions, the pest pressure is going to reside. Um, but if that doesn't work, uh, if that cultural practice doesn't work, then we recommend that mechanical removal. Can you mechanically remove things? So it could be if like, say you have a specific plant that has a pest problem, can you remove those pests manually? Um, like if you have a vegetable garden, you know, tomato hornworms, you know, just get a, a, a little cup of soapy water and you just pick those tomato hornworms and drop them in the soapy water. That's, that's a mechanical control. And if you can't control mechanically, we then say, okay, the third step would be what's biological controls. What are those biological controls or natural controls that we can implement to help manage pest pressure? So if you're following then that cultural and do mechanical and biological controls, then that last step would be specifically um, that chemical treatment. And that's where you're, you're spraying, uh, you're coming in and you're, you're, you or somebody could be spraying the plants for insects or other pathogens um, with different types of chemical controls. Um, and that we usually want that to be the last step. So we're not having uh, resistance developed with some of those, uh, those pesticides, as well as to make sure that we're reducing the, reducing the amount that we're using in the landscape. So that's what the integrated pest management is, is walking through that four step method uh, to make sure that we're managing pests as responsibly as possible and minimizing the amount of inputs needed uh, for that landscape. So that's a very good question. And it's a little bit different than other methods because it's a lot of times, you know, and I, I, a lot of our uh, landscape professionals, they can't do scouting and scouting is just that time that you're looking around for uh, pests. So they set people up based off of best management practices for spray application. So they're usually just going right to the spraying and leaving the, the remainder up to the homeowners, but that's not always done. So for man for pest management. So some people I believe hey, you can hire to do IPM, but that's not always going to be the case. Yes, sir. We we have a question from the floor here at the Cade Museum. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Clem, two questions. Um, how do we go about getting soil tests uh, to you and get the results back? And also on citrus greening, if you have dooryard uh, citrus, how's the best way to manage that if you think you already have a case of that in the home? I've heard people pouring uh, oak leaf tea onto trees and otherwise pruning them back very severely. Any thoughts on that? So yeah, um, so the soil test, um, there's a soil testing lab in U with UF. Um, Jenny, I'll get you that resource and it's just an online form and you can take, the, you can mail your soil test in that sample in and or you can hand deliver it and then you'll get a copy um, and I'll get a copy of it. It's, it's actually really easy to do. Um, so I'll make sure I send that out so you all can get access to that. It's a great resource. Um, with regards to citrus greening, there's a lot that we're still learning. Um, 
there's amazing research that's going on currently with citrus screening because of how you know important citrus is to our agricultural industry um also just the identity of florida but um you know citrus screening there is no cure but it used to be the recommendation that if your citrus tree tested positive for greening then you would cut down the tree that's no longer the recommendation that was to help reduce and slow the spread of greening but greening is all over the state um so yeah oak leaf compost tea there's still research going on with that we don't have definitive details but we're learning that there's a strange connection between oak trees and citrus that's something with the tannins within the oak trees have the ability to um minimize the symptoms or reduce the symptoms of citrus screening within a citrus tree um but you know the quality of that oak compost tea is very important because you can unintentionally end up spraying a pathogen in as well that could if um, affect the citrus but um one thing that we are recommending that if you do believe that you have citrus screening you can always still go get it tested um, at the plant diagnostic center on us campus or the department of plant industries on 34th they both have testing labs um, but what you can do some of the general recommendations is just make sure you're following that fertilizer recommendations for Doriar citrus. Um, and also one of our researchers, uh, Dr. Juanita Popano, she's about to retire, I believe, but um, she's given that recommendation of increasing micronutrient spray um, three times the amount, but I'm not exactly sure what that full recommendation is off the top of my head. So the nice thing is just more comes down to proper nutrient management at this time, but we're still trying to develop this final recommendations for uh, greening management, but the research has been looking very, very promising. Dr. Clem, there was one final question in the chat that said, do mosquitoes need soil or just water? Primarily, they need that standing water for a certain period of time. That's where the larval, the larva stage of the mosquitoes need to be. And for some reason, I have a number stuck in my head. It's like seven to 10 days is the life cycle. So making sure that at least every three, four days, you might have to flush out water. Um, but it's, it's more going to be that standing water is going to be the issue for all um, for mosquitoes. So some of the big concerns that we usually see with regards to the mosquito population isn't necessarily the plant material. Um, it isn't necessarily like the, a bird bath or something like that, because you were going to replenish for baths. Um, it's typically going to be water containers that are, are out, things outside that are holding water, like uh, a pot that's holding water that you doesn't have a hole in it. So it's not draining. So just holding water, tires, anything that can hold water, that's going to become a, a mosquito nesting habitat. Um, so really, you know, there's been a lot of research looking at how we can work with communities to make sure that there's nothing containing water out in our landscapes to help reduce mosquito populations. Um, in South Florida, that was a huge social, man social marketing program when Zika virus was prominent in South Florida, was really looking at how to eliminate standing water resources. And it's typically not associated with our, it's, it still is in the landscape, but it's not as problematic in the landscape as is in other sources. Dr. Clem, thank you so much for a great presentation. Uh, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you for all attending today. And um, this year, our rotary theme, Dr. Clem, is uh, rotary opens opportunities. And, you know, we try to <clears throat> excuse me, talk about that in many ways, but our theme is that, and I have a commemorative coin I'd like to share with you uh, for your presentation today and the opportunities that, you know, we can focus on one of the areas, primary areas of focus of Rotary, and that's water, okay, and uh, it is spring, and who does not love a beautiful landscape, so what a timely and uh, insightful and valuable presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you all. I want to circle back to guest. I have Don up here working and his beautiful wife Penny's back here with us today. And I, I always love to see you. Thank you for being here today and sharing Don up front. Um, Jenny did post a reminder in the chat, not an announcement, but before the end of the month, 
we're still collecting those theme baskets for the school incentive program. So if you have a theme basket, we're thinking about it. There's still a couple weeks. Uh, please put that together. You can deliver it to her office. You can bring it here next week. We'll get a tour. Uh, but there's still that push and in, in, in helping out in the school program. So next week we have uh, the daughter. We have one of our own, uh, Ivan Ulrich, past president, and daughter of one of our own, Laurie Vidal. Uh, his daughter, Sarah Vidal Finn. They're going to talk about not just this beautiful building, but this beautiful area out here and this revitalization. So uh, you'll be excited. It'll be a great presentation and it'll be uh, some of our own. And uh, we'll be excited to, to hear that and be a part. So do not miss next week. Quote of the day, life is like a landscape. You live in the midst of it, but you can describe it only from the vantage point of distance. Charles Lindbergh. Have a great week, fellow returns. Bye.